All right. Well, kia ora and uh, welcome everyone. My name's Matthew Cutler-Welsh. I'm uh, looking after the, the session today, MC, uh, for this hour. Uh, we are here for the launch of the Healthy Home Guide, which is very exciting. And uh, we want to acknowledge everyone who's contributed to that and, uh, and also just introduce it to you all. We are recording this uh, session on Zoom today, so if you don't want to appear on the on the video, then please feel free to um, turn off your webcam. But it is really nice to to see you, uh, and uh, and also to hear from you. As I just mentioned, we do have quite a lot of people on the call, so if you can just mute yourself uh, while you're not talking, that would be uh, helpful so that we can hear the speakers during today. Um, so we've got a, a, a collection of speakers to just talk about some of the, uh, the component, the parts of the uh, Healthy Home Guide, but also a little bit of the, the backstory. Um, a big part of that, from my point of view, while, um, while I've got the mic, uh, is that I've thought about quite a lot in the last little while that it's very easy to complain. And we do quite a lot of complaining in, in the, the building industry, particularly us who feel uh, like we're a little bit enlightened about better ways of building. We like to complain about the building code and about the way things should be done. It's much harder to actually do something about that and to put something out there, put yourself out there and provide a, an alternative uh, and a better way of of doing things. And that's exactly what the Healthy Home Guide is all about. And a uh, big, big well done to Damien uh, and also everyone who's, um, who has contributed. I know Damien will uh, try and um, share that, that credit and say that it's, it wasn't all his work, but I just want to acknowledge the work that Damien has done because any project like this is uh, like herding cats, really. Uh, everyone's got uh, pretty strong opinions and it's a really big challenge uh, for uh, someone to, to lead that group and to try and bring everything together into something that is useful. Um, I also want to um, point out that this is the first step of a journey and by no means are we pretending that this is a, a done deal and a finished, final, polished Pro, uh, product and, and indeed there are some sections still to be included in, in the, the whole uh, framework and the whole piece uh, which um, no doubt Damien will, will talk about but it is a journey and we really appreciate everyone's input into that um, up to this point and also um, onwards as well and also I'd like to acknowledge of course uh, Bob and Martin uh, having started the uh, super home movement what was it, five, six more years ago now, uh, which has uh, allowed this process to happen. All right, um, but this isn't about me, so I want to hand over very quickly. Uh, we are going to hear from um, a number of the team who have been uh, a big part of putting the, the project together. So today we're going to hear from uh, Damien, who's been the project manager bringing this all together. Um, also, uh, Catherine, we're really pleased to have Catherine on board um, from uh, Asthma New Zealand to talk about um, some of the why of, of why we need the Healthy Home Guide. And we have some other um, various speakers. We've got Henry uh, McTavish, Richard Hollard, Warren Clark, and also Brandon, who are going to just give a little bit of a, an overview of some of the, the details that you might find in the Healthy Home Guide. So that's it. Uh, let's hand over to Damien for a, a quick introduction. And I will um, change my screen here and hand the microphone over to you, Damien. Cool. Thanks, Matthew. A super healthy welcome to Super Home Central, everyone. Uh, we've been, Warren and I have been banished upstairs because of too much noise and the big party going on downstairs. Uh, so. We're not with them, but we'll go down and join them when this is finished. Before I start, um, as Matthew says, I'd like to thank our super dads. 
Bob and Martin for having the vision and foresight to launch the Super Home Movement five years ago. Without them, we wouldn't be sitting here, obviously. I'd also like to thank the contributors to this guide who gave their time voluntarily to help put this super website resource together. I really need to make special mention of three unsung superheroes for the commitment to the guide cause. David Streeton, uh, David's our super graphic designer. Uh, he brought our ideas to life and well exceeded our expectations. I think he may have even revolutionized how guides are, are done in the future. So big thanks to David. John Baker, John is the super sketch supremo. All the sketches in this guide are thanks to John's nothing is a problem attitude and his, his skill. Um, so thanks, big thanks to John. I actually think, I actually know that he's had some interest in uh, some other commissions coming up. So hopefully that, that goes well for him. And, and thirdly, um, Beth Black, Beth works for Bob. Um, so, that, so she's Bob's Beth Black. Uh, she spent two days solid reviewing content and grammar prior to launch. Um, if there's any commas missing, it's not Beth's fault. She got everything. It's uh, David and I that missed it on the Sunday over a couple of beers when we were doing the corrections. Love your work, Beth. Right. So why, why now, why us? Well, I got asked to write a Healthy Homes Guide at the start of the year, but during lockdown, uh, it was apparent that the funding was drying up. I got talking to Bob, who already had the bones of a guide written, and we decided it was high time to just get it done. I thought that I could just use all the good content on LinkedIn and quickly cobble something together. Uh, I had no idea what I was getting myself in for, and I was... Yeah, no idea about the super reference document we've, we've now created. I did reach out to other organizations to create a more collaborative project, but in the end, the super home movement wanted to do this the most. So that was May and seven months later, here we are. So I wanna just take you through the introduction and, and purpose of the guide. Um, not sure whether Matthew's got that on his, on his screen. Cool. Um, housing's all about people. And as a construction industry, we sometimes forget that. We, we think it's about building another house, but it's actually building someone's home, somewhere where someone's gonna live. So, our homes significantly influence our health and well-being, and this can be in a positive and negative way. People obviously often spend 80 to 90% of their time in their home, especially older people when they're very young. Therefore, it's important the home provides the best possible living environment so it protects and nurtures the body and mind. A place where family can live salubriously, look that word up, and flourish and be successful. To achieve this, a home should be well designed and built to stand strong, be resilient, durable, efficient in size and cost, while being kind to both its family and the environment. There must be due consideration to the land we live in. In our opinion, a healthy home is characterized by heroes. Healthy, efficient, resilient, on purpose, environmental and sustainable. Healthy is promoting optimum health and well-being through its design, resilience, and efficiency. Efficient, size and space, affordable, energy positive for the life of the building. Resilient, resilient enough to withstand earthquakes and climatic conditions. Durable, to stand the test of time. On purpose, designed specifically with heroes in mind and fit for purpose. Environmental, socially, economic, economically and environmentally sustainable to build and run. Concern of climate change. Sustainable, meeting our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And even if you don't follow this whole guide, just consider these four simple steps 
to improve the health and welfare of your family in the next home that you're involved in. Prioritize design and make sure you engage the right experts. Have a design workshop with the full project team as soon as you're able and explain why everybody, why you want to build a healthy home. That's, that's one step that I found that is absolutely critical. Upgrade your window to low, windows to low-E glass with thermally broken or non-conductive frames and install them within the thermal envelope in line with insulation. This will reduce heat loss by up to 50% compared with standard double glazing and also minimize the risk of condensation. Make your home as airtight as you can to reduce the initial cost of installing heating and ongoing running costs. Install an appropriate ventilation system to reduce humidity, increase comfort, health, and durability. The mantra is build tight and ventilate right. The, the purpose of this guide was to provide a step change pathway to help designers and professionals bridge the gap between the current builder code and international best practice solutions required to, to achieve a healthy, resilient, durable, comfortable, affordable, low carbon home. We're trying to keep things straightforward and, and follow a path that's easy to implement. Hence, the base better best format. The guide is intended to ensure that projects are planned, designed and executed on the basis of super standards, design principles, aesthetics, function and universal design. And we'll hear more about some of those things shortly. This is an industry reference document. We, next year, we will look at a condensed version uh, to, to help the consumer, um, educate the consumer around help them make more informed decisions and better outcomes for their families. This is the living document and will be updated regularly to reflect improved technology and methods. Thanks for everybody that's uh, come send in messages to date and picked up all our typos that we've that David and I missed too, by the way. I really appreciate it. So we need a systems thinking approach and we're trying to provide an alternative solution to the current building code. Really, really important. This is not a rating tool. We're not trying to compete with other rating tools. This is just a guide that's trying to provide a step change to get between code minimum and international best practice. We realize that we're not going to get to international best practice overnight and we need to do things in baby steps. Well, what's a healthy home? It wasn't until the end of August that uh, we worked that process that, that out for ourselves. Um, and so it's quite late in the piece really to, to sort this out. But we come up with the fact that it's in a high indoor environmental quality. Thermal comfort, visual comfort, acoustic comfort and indoor air quality. The thing is that we decided to go further. We needed to take a holistic approach Consider the building as a whole system. Think of resilience and durability, along with humanistic considerations like universal design and landscaping. After all, as we said, housing is about people. So we have these targets, base, better, best. And the idea of the targets is that they're not static and they can be adjusted over time as industry understanding and confidence improves. We've, we've set the first target as a healthy home, and that's meeting base, the base standards in this document. Achieving the base level will ensure superior indoor environmental quality, with the home being warmer, drier, more airtight, more energy efficient and friendlier on the environment than a new home constructed to current New Zealand minimum standards. The really important thing here is verification is determined by ongoing performance monitoring. We want to know that what we're doing actually works. It's that feedback loop. And we have two other, two other um, levels of better and best. And we've set these as, as super home standards. We've, we're able to define now what a super home is. 
And the idea is that people that are involved in the super home movement are involved in creating that super home. So what you'll see is at the end of each chapter, you'll see this, the technical solutions and the space better best. Sorry. And it, there's, a, there's a whole section on a matrix, which is a summary of this, which you'll be able to use to put together uh, a design brief with your clients. So hopefully that the whole process is quite useful. We think it is, feedback today has been it is. So yeah, that's what I've got to say. Um, it's been a, an incredible journey. Unfortunately, the journey probably just starts now because we've got to get this out and market it and promote it and get it used. But uh, yeah, over to you, Matthew. Absolutely. Uh, it is just the beginning, Damien. Uh, but you should have a little bit of a celebration and a bit of a holiday first uh, before we jump into um, the next next stage. Um, all right. So, yeah, thank you for that. And hopefully that gives a, a, a brief overview. Um, and I've put the link up there. People can jump in and um, have a look. The, the guide is live. Uh, which I should have mentioned at the start, healthyhomedesignguide.co.nz will get you there. And you can have a play around and um, have a look through the sections as we are talking about them. Uh, all right, so I'd like to now hand over to Catherine. Catherine is from uh, Asthma New Zealand and they do some incredible work out in the community, working with people that we've all heard about, a lot of us have heard about and are very conscious of the fact that we have some kind of scary statistics that we're not all that proud of, and we shouldn't be proud of in New Zealand. Uh, and Catherine and her team are at, at the coalface of that and, and helping uh, as best as they can with those with those people. So to hand, uh, to hear about a little bit more about the need for uh, the Healthy Home Guide, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today, uh, Catherine. Kia uh, ora. Kia ora tato, um, ko Catherine Leitner, aho. Matthew, thank you for that. And um, look, it's an incredible privilege to have been asked to or to have been included in this conversation. I think from Asthma New Zealand perspective, we've been around for 49 years and we've worked incredibly hard over those 49 years to make a material difference in the health of, uh, of New Zealand. Sadly, we really haven't made progress. And so I, I just want to have a, a bit of a conversation with you around that. And um, I think just picking up on Damien's point now, um, he's absolutely right. Um, creating a guide is, 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 is the easy part. You know, after all is said and done, so much more is said than done. You know, and so um, we really do need to start to see some um, changes and, and, and at least not just in your sector, the way in which we go about what we do needs to be addressed as well. And so the one thing that we know, and Damien said, this is nothing works in isolation. Everything works as a system. And so if we are to start to address some of the social issues that um, are, are, are bulging at the seams in this country, um, we need to um, make sure that the community are included in the solution. And so for Asthma New Zealand to be included in this conversation allows us to bring our patients' voices to the table. It allows us to be um, another reference point. It also allows us to use what we know is occurring out there for the value of those wanting to make the improvements. So I could go and quote a number of statistics, and I know that people love hearing statistics. The problem with statistics is that um, we know that facts, fear, and force don't change behavior. You know, we've heard statistics quoted now. Um, every, every election, we start to see them bandied around as if there's some sort of pregnant pause or for dramatic impact, but nothing changes. You know, so I, 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 I could make it, you know, I could make the quote that, you know, 20%, close to 20% of New Zealanders um, live with respiratory disease. You know, I, I could tell you all that, you know, every year you, I, as taxpayers are forking out $7 billion dollars to address the health issue um, that, 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 that is respiratory. Uh, it's the third largest killer. I could tell you all of that. You already probably know that. You've seen those statistics um, bandied around. 
So what I would like to do is just point out a little bit in terms of why this conversation is so important to Aotearoa now. You'll all be familiar that New Zealand is 42% lower than the hourly OECD average in terms of productivity. So 42% lower than the hourly average in terms of productivity, yet we work some of the highest hours of all the OECD countries. Now, I'll just give you some context because I know a number of you will be employers watching this. As employers, what you need to understand is that 17% of your workforce have asthma. Okay, 74% are unable to work to their full potential as long as their asthma is poorly managed. We know that in an organization, their productivity will decrease by 37% across the board as a consequence of the impact that asthma has on productivity. And so if those statistics aren't important enough to the business community, I, I'm not quite sure what is. Often we say, if you really want to get change, hit the bottom line, hit the pocket first. And so I think, you know, those are some of the numbers that may be really, really important um, for a number of the listeners. For those of you who are listening in from a slightly different perspective, just want to um, share some of the things that our nurses see when they walk into people's homes. Some of the stories that they hear of young kids piling washing on top of them at night so that they can stay warm in their house. They've walked into bedrooms and the bedrooms have had ice on the inside of the windows. Uh, you know, they've got, they've walked in and the whole entire visit, they can see their breath when they're talking to the patients. Uh, the, 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 the gaps in, in, in windows um, is just is 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 is, is huge. Uh, you, know, you could see you know, broad daylight through a closed door, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, I think most New Zealanders, we just thought that was normal. Um, it, it it really um, can't be left as normal anymore because the consequence is is far too great. Uh, we're slipping behind in so many respects in so many areas. One of the statistics that you may be interested to know is that people that have asthma or poorly managed, 66% of them also report living with mental health issues. New Zealand's got one of the highest mental health issues in the world. Um, in terms of diabetes, New Zealand also has one of the highest, fastest growing rates. There's a strong correlation between childhood asthma and, and, and diabetes. So, you know, it, this, this is a conversation that, that needs to be brought out into the um, into mainstream. Um, it can't be just left to election time. It can't be just left to those who want to push um, a, 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 a ratings guide or um, push a product, this has to be a movement. And so um, I just really, really want to acknowledge everybody that's been involved in this project because the intent behind this project is not about apportioning blame, who's done wrong. Blame is about as useful as algebra is to a five-year-old right now. It's not going to help us. What's going to help us is finding the right way forward. And so I think that this guide is a, is a really brilliant step. So just to wrap up, you know, Asthma New Zealand are incredibly proud to be part of this dialogue and certainly want and will be the voice of our population. We have the privilege of speaking for almost 20% of New Zealanders. And so we, we take that seriously. So we will be a very, very strong voice uh, moving forward. We need to see some changes and just really want to acknowledge the work that's being done. And this, as was said by Matthew, this is the start. And um, we look forward to walking that journey with you all. Kia ora kato. Great, thank you very much, Catherine. And thanks again for the great work that you and your team uh, continue to do out in the community. It's very important work. And uh, yeah, while those uh, statistics can get overwhelming, I think it is important for us to 
to hear them uh, and to hear them again and to, and to share them to, to reconnect with, with why we do what we do. Another great cause that I think is very undervalued is the concept of universal design. And I, I came across this probably for the first time when I was working at the, uh, at the Green Building Council um, uh, quite a few years ago now. And the biggest outtake for me for universal design is that it's not about old people in wheelchairs. It's about everyone, hence the name universal. And I've experienced this firsthand. Uh, and most of us will have experienced some sort of inconvenience whether we're unfortunate enough to be on crutches for a day or if even if we're just inviting a family member into our into our own homes and, and experience them not being able to, to do something or the house not functioning in the way uh, that is helpful and optimal for them. So universal design plays a critical role in the overall health and effectiveness of our home. So I'd like to welcome now uh, Henry from um, uh, to talk about the, the important, Henry McTavish, sorry, uh, to discuss briefly the importance of universal design and why we've included it as part of the Healthy Home Guide. So Henry, are you, uh, yes, you're unmuted. Go, uh, unmuted. You, you have the floor. Great, well, thanks very much for the introduction, Matthew, and hello to everyone. So we're just gonna talk a bit about universal design. And as Matthew said, it's really about design for everyone. So it's not exclusive. It includes anyone of any age, any ability, any mobility, um, any stage in life. And I think that's an important narrative that really needs to be opened up with our design. I think with a lot of housing that we're designing at the moment, we've got an ideal. Um, and if we start looking at other other parts of our population we start othering what universal design really is doing is telling people to um start acknowledging who we are and everyone that's actually in our lives um so entering the home who's part of the family who's part of your community so that it can include children it can include grandparents parents um people with different forms of um issues perhaps you know wheelchair users so one thing about universal design it's not just about accessible design it includes everyone so there's a number of considerations so at any one time 25 percent of our population suffers from a disability so we've got permanent disability which might include you know wheelchair users blindness so they're kind of the obvious ones, which we can look at the design of, but there's also temporary um, disability, which might be, say, a broken leg. I think one really interesting um, group of people that that includes is um, pregnancy. You know, quite often the house actually becomes quite a um, challenge to function while you're pregnant. There's also situational disability. So, I think with the current design that we're going for, which is generally designed for someone who's about five foot 10, um, this can really create issues for children. They find it quite challenging. So if, I don't know, you know, um, with slipping as well, choosing the wrong products, um, for me being someone who wears glasses, color contrast is actually a big issue. So white on white. Um, that creates issues for me. Um, another thing that we've really got to consider as we move forward in our society and defining what a community is, um, we're actually an aging population in New Zealand. So a number of areas throughout New Zealand, such as Tauranga, um, I think by 2025, they're going to have 24% um, of the population is actually going to be retired that's going to require a different style of building that's more inclusive and adaptable to the changing needs of people. So it is going to be a huge problem. Um, another interesting change within our culture as well is the intergenerational living where grandparents, you've got perhaps three generations of people living under one roof. So everyone has completely different needs. So that's where universal design comes in handy because it's really acknowledging 
and trying to create spaces that are adaptable for everyone. So there's another number of key areas. So you've got your access pathways. So just creating step free, flush kind of entrances. Um, allowing free movement around the home. I think, you know, kind of wider doorways, wider hallways. Um, flooring, look at slip resistance within bathrooms. Um, I think I got a report from ACC and falls within the shower over a three year period resulted. I think the claims were something like 140 million. So it's a huge, huge problem for everyone and this does affect everyone. Um, so kind of in connection to the healthy homes thing, I've been working for a number of years in green building. Um, the narrative about people hasn't particularly been addressed significantly, but um, it's such a key kind of area as far as our sustainable future goes. Um, and as much as when someone moves into the home, um, you're going to find out pretty soon if the house actually functions for you and functions for all the people within it. Um, I think I was talking to a number of kitchen designers and they said, you know, kind of probably 20% of kitchens are ripped out within two years of installation. Sometimes it's going to be aesthetic, but often it's going to be about function. So it's really just looking at the intelligence, but really sitting down with people and just acknowledging the lives that they lead, everyone who's in their lives, creating adaptable spaces you know, that function for everyone and, you know, function for the future. So, you know, hopefully it's something that is just going to be adopted as a standard because, you know, for me, you have a building, but what gives the building heart is actually the people. And I think we need to acknowledge the um, needs of all people and, you know, create healthy communities where everyone can live as one, you know, in a healthy, sustainable sort of way. So thank you very much. I think that's about it. Oh. Great. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, it makes me think that um, some of the things that we have in common is that in an ideal world, some of our organisations wouldn't need to exist. And, and in some ways, Superhome is one of those. Asthma New Zealand is, is probably one, but University of Design, LifeMark, you know, if, if, if we actually had uh, adequate standards, uh, then we probably wouldn't need to have these associations. But the reality is that, that we do need to have these to, to encourage the design community and building and construction to consider these, these issues uh, appropriately. All right, now moving on to uh, some of the other technical details, I'm going to introduce uh, Richard Hollard, who's uh, sitting in the room next door to me uh, here at ProClimber, um, to talk a little bit about air tightness and ventilation, uh, because this is an important part of the envelope for the actual performance of the building. So uh, Richard, uh, you unmuted now? Yes. Yep, all righty, go for it. Cool, very good. Thanks uh, for uh, having me on here today, Matthew. I appreciate the opportunity and it's great to be involved with uh, Superhome and, and what they've done to date so far. And I think this is going to really, this uh, design guide is really going to take it to the next level as far as uh, putting the message out there. So um, yeah, the fact that I've been tasked with talking about air tightness and ventilation today, um, I guess gives you a little bit of a hint to the fact that they should be uh, always considered together. Um, it's a bit like, uh, I like to think of it, I've got some little props here on the table, uh, a knife and fork, uh, where some of you are probably eating their lunch uh, at some of the launch parties around the country. And it's a little bit hard if you just use your fork, uh, and it's also quite difficult to eat lunch if you just use a knife. Uh, you put the two of them together, they work well, uh, and synerg is a synergistic, I don't know if that's a word, but uh, they have synergy that the sum of the two parts uh, is greater than, um, yeah, the sum is greater than the, the, the uh, putting the two together. So it's, ventilation and air tightness is a little bit like that. Um, if we um, have a highly ventilated home, um, that's great for air quality. Uh, but as far as uh, the uh, building's uh, energy efficiency, um, then that's not so good. Uh, that's not sort of optimizing uh, the potential of the ventilation. Um, and in some ways, highly ventilating with uh, no air tightness is not good for your quality because we 
don't know where that area is coming from. Um, it could be coming through the walls, uh, through gaps and cracks in the building envelope. And also if we um, uh, make our building airtight uh, and don't ventilate it, uh, that ha can have issues as well. We're basically entrapping uh, the moisture that we create within the building. And if we're not ventilating that out, uh, then um, we're going to suffer and potentially the building is going to suffer as well. So you put the two together, air tightness and ventilation, and that's uh, where the benefits really come. And I'll talk to you a little bit about some of those benefits of uh, the two things together. And when, uh, just firstly, when we're talking about air tightness, um, we're referring to a layer inside the installation, a dedicated control layer. Um, at ProClimber here, we talk about a lot about uh, control layers and buildings um, and a systematic approach to designing the building. So we've got the insulation layer as a continuous control layer. We've got a continuous weather tightness layer on the outside of our buildings, uh, keeping everything nice and dry from that, uh, from that rain and uh, also from the UV. Uh, we've got a continuous air tightness layer on the inside uh, of the insulation, uh, stopping air and moisture getting into that insulating space and uh, minimizing the risk of interstitial condensation. And that own, not only for the, the, the house or the building's benefit as far as um, reducing mold, but also obviously for the occupant's benefit. And uh, like others have already said today, everything we do uh, needs to be based around um, the uh, benefit to the occupant uh, being at the end of the day that's why we're building a house for us to uh, get shelter from the outdoor environment um, and uh, we've always, always got to have that uh, focus on you know, is this thing that we're putting into a house going to be uh, improve our, our health or our well-being. So um, we've got the control layers, weather tightness, insulation, air tightness on the inside um, and we talk about this thermal envelope uh, and when, with regards to air tightness. So that includes the floor, includes the walls, includes the, the ceiling or the roof. Um, so these things need to be continuous. And then we also talk about um, the ventilation also needing to be continuous. Um, now, typically New Zealand homes have been uh, poorly ventilated um, and not that airtight, but they are getting um, more airtight uh, sort of almost by default um, and too airtight uh, to not be properly ventilated to, to for positive health outcomes. Um, we know the building code um, has, it's pretty fuzzy, it's no real uh, particular target as far as, um, as, far as air tightness. Um, and also for ventilation, we were relying currently in the, in the building code on uh, openable windows. Now that's, uh, that's great if you've got the perfect conditions and you've got some windows open on both sides of the house um, and you've got a breeze. Uh, and I like to think of that a bit like driving along in your car. If you're driving along 50 k's an hour through town and you've got a little, the windows down, you've got a nice bit of a gentle breeze. Um, but if you've got no breeze or if you're going 100 k's on the open road or if it's a wet or windy or cold day, you like to put the windows up and uh, rely on the car's ventilation system for the supply of fresh air and the, the extraction of moisture. So it's a little bit like that in a house, thinking about the design of the house, uh, the air tightness and, and ventilation uh, more systematically and designing it in on purpose. Um, I like that word that Damien was saying earlier, things are being done on purpose. We're designing these parts of the house, these control layers, the air tightness control layer, and the continuous ventilation uh, control system um, on purpose uh, for the benefit of uh, the, the occupant. So I guess four main things that we talk about when we're looking at air tightness and ventilation as far as uh, the uh, benefits of those. Firstly, comfort, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, comfort. So, I mean, the main reason for having a house and uh, is being comfortable inside away from the elements. Um, we, uh, we all know what it's like to live in an uncomfortable house, uh, especially this time of the year in Auckland with uh, high relative humidity or high total humidity rates. Um, houses can be very humid if they're not uh, properly ventilated and if we don't extract moisture from the house. Likewise, if it's too hot or if it's too cold, uh, we know what it's like to be 
living in these houses because to be honest you know, most New Zealand houses are still um, not that uh, great at achieving um, a good in indoor air quality and uh, comfort level so um, with regards to comfort um, the human body we like to be sort of between 18 and 23 degrees um, and between 40 and 60 percent humidity um, and if we can maintain if our building envelope allows us to maintain those those conditions then we're going to be most comfortable uh, right throughout the year uh, and also the likelihood of uh, things like um, humidity bacteria viruses fungi all those sort of things all those things that um, cause allergies as well uh, and cause um, respiratory conditions like asthma are much less likely to occur if we've got uh, the humidity at between 40 and 60 percent and also the uh, temperature between sort of 18 to 23 degrees so um, this these dedicated layers uh, good insulation good windows air tightness layer and constant um, mechanical ventilation uh, mechanical heat recovery ventilation so we can keep the, the costs of heating down as well so we're not extracting all of our uh, heat out the window um, those thing, two things combined uh, give us that ideal uh, much high chance of re, re, uh, achieve, achieving that um, comfort level. So comfort and health are two uh, closely related. Uh, generally, if we're comfortable, we're sitting around that 18 to 24 degrees and 40 to 60 percent humidity. We're probably going to be much healthier as well um, because of all those things that uh, I spoke about earlier with humidity and bacteria and viruses, etc., being uh, less prevalent. Um, the uh, energy efficiency is a big one. So um, if we basically um, rely on windows for ventilation um, or we don't have a very uh, airtight building envelope, we can't expect our building envelope to be very energy efficient because we're basically at the mercy of the elements. Um, and if it's a windy day, we have air leakage in and out of the building envelope at will. Um, and if we're trying to maintain that comfortable temperature, um, that's either going to be impossible or um, it's going to cost us a lot of money to do that through uh, excess heating or cooling. Um, so energy efficiency with dedicated air tightness layer and good mechanical heat recovery ventilation, uh, we can achieve comfort and health uh, very efficiently all year round uh, through, through use of those two things. Um, and also durability, um, while the main purpose of the house is obviously to uh, keep us comfortable and healthy, the, the humans, um, it needs to be durable so that the house needs to be healthy as well, basically. It's about the house, house being healthy. Um, and if we can keep moisture out of places uh, where it shouldn't be uh, in our construction, uh, then the house, as far as uh, mould and rot and uh, rust and corrosion um, and all the, the bad things that go with moisture being in areas uh, close to moisture sensitive materials like timber and concrete and steel and that sort of thing. Um, the, uh, the house is going to be much more durable if we're controlling that. So with dedicated control layer of air tightness and extraction of moisture through with a mechanical heat recovery ventilation system, uh, the durability of the structure is, is maintained as well. So, so yeah, we're ticking the four boxes um, through the use of dedicated control layers of air tightness and a good uh, mechanical heat recovery ventilation system of comfort, health, energy efficiency and durability. And that's the, uh, the happy position that we can be in. Um, and uh, we've got all that. We've got a, a healthy home and a super home. Awesome. Thank awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Now we're going to uh, just quickly hear from two other uh, sections uh, before we hand back over to uh, Damien to, to close off. So uh, another area that's often overlooked is acoustics and uh, pleased to welcome uh, Warren Clark, who's sitting in Christchurch and uh, Damien's awesome background. Uh, might just... Yep, there you go. Go for it, Warren. Are you hearing me? All right, good. Yep. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Much appreciated. Um, sound um, and hearing is, uh, it's interesting actually, because it's one of the five senses, but you find that when you design houses or you go into houses, it's invariably never even considered in the, in the design process. And yet um, acoustics and sound in a home uh, can have a huge effect on the comfort level of, of a home. 
Um, you know, as a designer, we, we design these beautiful spaces. They're often um, fairly large volumes and we like to fill them up with nice hard surfaces like polished concrete floors and, uh, and bench tops and pl plywood and, uh, and things like that. And then uh, without considering the acoustics, um, those spaces can actually become quite com uh, uncomfortable quite quickly. Um, even small spaces need to be considered. The smaller homes that we have uh, and we're trying to build more of um, with an aged population, um, acoustics is, 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 is uh, very important. Um, World Health recommendations is, uh, says that uh, uh, a comfortable level for a home should be less or equal to 45 decibels. And uh, when you consider that the average dishwasher is 45 decibels, um, it can get over that quite quickly. Um, so acoustic design really does need to be considered at the early stage, at the design process, um, at, at the, at when you're sitting down and, and coming up with that, uh, that beautiful concept, because when the structure is built and you're living in it and uh, you've got your lovely high ceilings and it's the sounds bouncing off all that jib and, um, uh, and the, the concrete floors and bits like that, uh, it can be a little too late to do. Um, and it can also be expensive to retrofit. Um, what we tend to do is rely on soft furnishings like um, couches and curtains and, and uh, rugs and carpets and things, but it really, it really doesn't um, do enough for a home. Um, you know, we've all had that, uh, that experience of being in cafes and bars and, and uh, places like that uh, and talking to the person next to you and then finding out you can't hear them. Um, because the acoustics in the, in the, in the environment is, is uh, not considered at the design stage. Um, one of the things I, I will look for now is um, the Grand Designs program. You've, you've all watched them. Um, and what I find really interesting now is the conversation they have at the very end when they talk about the, the process of design and how they get through it all and that sort of thing. And if you can pick up an echo in the background uh, of that small conversation, then the acoustics in that room is really poor. So it happens um, when you're aware of it, uh, it happens quite often. Um, so I think acoustics uh, is, should be given far more importance than it is. Um, you know, you look at our communities and we are getting them denser. Um, we are having more and more noise coming in from outside. Um, everything from the cars in the street to motor miles and uh, aircraft overhead, uh, and we need to spend more time um, considering acoustics uh, in, in the design. Um, I can talk from experience because um, three years ago I designed a, uh, a Homestar 10 house, and as part of the rating system in that, uh, you had to consider acoustics. So we, were, we put in um, acoustic glass uh, in certain windows, and we put an acoustic ceiling in, um, and it really does add to the comfort level of uh, that environment. Um, I've had musicians comment to me that um, my house has uh, better acoustics than some recording studios. Um, and one night we had upwards of 30 people in a very small space of only about sort of 40 or 50 square meters. Um, and I had um, elderly people comment that they could hear conversations with their hearing aids, which they weren't able to do before and can't do in some uh, uh, cafes and bars. So if we're going to be talking um, holistic design, um, then acoustics has to be part of that um, discussion and we need to consider acoustics uh, at the early stage of the design process. So um, short and sweet. Thank you, Matthew. Um, Thank you very much. Later. Awesome. And just finally, it's all well and good designing, building a house, but how do we know that's actually doing what it should be doing? And that's where monitoring comes in. So great to have Brandon from Tether to round out some of the technical conversation. Give us a brief overview of uh, monitoring and why that's important, Brandon. Cool, thanks, Matthew. Um, so I guess the question is, if there's a cake in front of you, would you rather be told that it tastes good or would you actually like to taste it? And if you taste it, does it taste good or doesn't it? You have to make up your mind. But when it comes to environmental quality, energy consumption, sustainability, these, these things can be monitored and managed. Now, monitoring has always been an interesting uh, topic when it comes to design and construction because it's, it's always seen as a bit too hard. There's uh, you know conversation around well what what does occupancy behavior do in terms of it and how can you really control for that? So it's it's almost been the missing link I guess in terms of of ultimate building performance. But 
with super home design, uh, the proof is in the pudding and, and the proof will be proven, I guess, using monitoring. Um, things like environmental quality, uh, energy consumption of houses, uh, what the carbon uh, impact of it from an operational perspective. These are all things that can be monitored using sensors and should be part of the design phase of the property. Uh, we should be building in monitoring systems into our houses so that when our occupants move in, uh, that capability is inherent inside the fabric of the house. And that data can be used for, for multiple different aspects, whether it's to improve on design. We shouldn't be scared of making mistakes when it comes to design. People make mistakes all the time. The idea of, of scientific rigor is actual continuous improvement using data to, to empower those decisions, right? So if you make a mistake or something doesn't work, improve upon it and use data to do that. So this continuous feedback loop um, from design and then post-occupancy and using the data as an output to continuously improve design or even just to educate is something that uh, is core to, to the super home movement and to super homes. Um, when it comes to uh, energy efficiency as well, it's all very well and, and fine to, to build an energy efficient home, but again, um, they can be operated in ways that make them very energy inefficient. You know, there's, there's uh, multiple examples of, of highly energy efficient homes that have been built only for people to operate them in the wrong way and they become very energy inefficient. When you have monitoring in place um, and sensors and things become part of the building fabric, this data can be used to either educate the occupants or they can educate themselves, but also help us designers and builders um, understand what we can do differently to try and change that behavior later down the track. Um, from our perspective, from, from Tether's perspective, where, where we see the best installation, I guess, I guess of, of sensors is understanding environmental quality with inside the house um, and air quality as it compares to external weather conditions and obviously energy consumption as well. A house is meant to be three things, right? Healthy, energy efficient or sustainable or have low operating costs as well as carbon neutral or try to be as carbon effective as possible. These things can all be worked out using good energy uh, or good environmental quality metrics, temperature, relative humidity, carbon dioxide, light, sound, atmospheric pressure, as well as some of the air quality metrics around volatile organic compounds and particulate matter but also understanding the full energy consumption of the house and how that house is being, uh, how that house is consuming uh, energy and then using those, that information relative to outdoor weather conditions to ultimately understand how the how house is holistically performing. So it is quite controversial in some respects, but it's absolutely necessary, especially with you know, the New Zealand government now looking at EPCs and specifically smart EPCs post-occupancy evaluation is becoming a, a standard and a norm. It's becoming expected. I think that uh, data-driven approaches will end up winning uh, in terms of their effectiveness. People that utilize data-driven approaches to continuously improve what they do will just end up getting better and better results and better outcomes. Um, eventually, I do think that it will become a standard. People, occupants will expect to move into a home that can communicate with them, can tell them how it's feeling, uh, can correct themselves. If you want to go as far as, as automation, you don't need to go down that route, but just giving the home, giving the, the, the home the ability to communicate with its occupants using a data-driven approach, I think is, uh, is something that is necessary and that it will continue to grow as people start to, to come to grips with it. Um, yeah, so I think that, that's my input, Matthew. It's a little bit short to sweet as well. There's, you know, could, could babble on for hours about this stuff, but it's core to the super hand movement. We have to have proof in the pudding. We have to prove that what we're doing is right um, and monitoring is the way to do it. Indeed. And I think we should all eat cake. Uh, very good point. It's a bit like, uh, it's kind of crazy to think that we're, we're effectively driving houses without any idea of how fast we're going or, or even what direction we're going in. Um, and uh, the, we do have the ability to do that now, which is, which is fantastic. Although some of us might find those results initially scary, um, then that would be a very good wake up call. Um, all right, now uh, we do have a, a few minutes. Uh, I'm just wondering, are there any, if there are any burning questions out there, uh, there's probably lots of questions of people um, wanting to find out more because we just kind of, the idea today is just to show you some examples of what's what's in the guide. But if there are any um, burning questions, please feel free to um, jump on the chat or, or even unmute yourself and uh, 
and ask a, a quick question. Uh, one of the things I would like to point out is that as we were scrolling through um, on the uh, through the guide, you may have noticed that there are some examples of actual products, and that's a uh, conscious decision to to include those because we wanted um, we wanted to strike a balance between being completely independent but also being useful and actually providing um, information on, on where you can go to get products, materials that help achieve a healthy home and not just leave everything so generic that it, it, it leaves designers and homeowners wondering um, who to talk to. So that's, that's the idea. And we have, uh, the idea is, is to try and uh, keep that uh, as independent as possible. They're not sponsored, uh, they are, uh, have provided information um, and, and time and input uh, for, for those links. Um, a couple of questions that have come through. Uh, where do you go to get access to the guides? Um, healthyhomedesignguide.co.nz. It's quite a long URL, but just healthyhomedesignguide.co.nz will take you there. There is also a link from the Superhome website. If you go to superhome.co.nz uh, and then click on guide, uh, you will um, you will find it. Um, the as we highlighted, the foundation of the the guide and the output, the definition of a super home, does work on the uh, base better best uh, levels, and that's that's shown in the um, in the introduction section of the the guide. Um, you will also notice on the the website here that there are some main sections. The bulk of the guide is uh, in this uh, menu here, Healthy Home Design Guide. And if you click on that, then you can jump to any of the individual chapters within the guide, within the design sections. And um, I'll, I'll, I do want to hand over to Damien for any last words, but I'll just point out that the order here is uh, more of a, uh, an order of how you might think of a, a building from the ground up. It's not, an, it's not so much a hierarchy of the importance because all of these things are important ingredients, uh, but it's more around you know, what's the order that you might think about those just to, to help um, structure it in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, Damien, any last words from you before we, we wrap up formally? We probably will stick online if people do want to hang around. I know that you've probably got some more beverages to drink there, down there in Christchurch. Uh, where, where should people go? What would you like people to do? And what's the, the next step, Damien? Oh, I think you're still muted. So, there you go. I'm muted. Thank you, Matthew, Catherine, Henry, Richard, Warren, and Brandon. Really, really appreciate uh, you joining us today and your contributions here. I think the big thing is we've got to get, can everyone get in behind us? Um, this is the most comprehensive guide, Healthy Homes guide that's been written. We need to affect change at a government level. Um, there is, there's a top down, bottom up approach. We, somebody asked a question, have we approached the government? The answer is yes. I uh, emailed every minister the other night. Um, I've also been having discussions with Kaingaora uh, to try and get them just to have a look at the guide. I think if, if we all get together, we can be the team of 5 million that affects lasting change in the building industry. It's it's the people that will make the difference. It's the people that will push the governments into setting standards and policies. And, and that's really what's got to happen. We have to, you know, as Catherine says, we have to. We have to for the benefit, for the health and well-being of the whole of Aotearoa. We have no choice. We can't carry on like we're doing. We can't keep doing the same thing every day and expecting a different result. It doesn't work. It's got to be a change. Here's a thought. What if we spend the five billion saved through the health system? 
and advance on providing healthy homes. How many healthy homes could we get for $5 billion? And how would that benefit our productivity and our health and well-being going forward? Consider that. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Damien. Thank you to Bob and Martin and the rest of the team. And thank you all for uh, being here today, being part of this launch. Um, please do check out the, uh, the website, go to superhome.co.nz if you missed that link. Otherwise, healthyhomedesignguide.co.nz will take you there. Um, and uh, yeah, go forth, uh, give us some feedback and look out for updates uh, because this is the, the, just the beginning of, of the journey. So thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, also the weekend.